Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's online event hosted by the International Inequalities Institute, uh, the III, here at the London School of Economics. My name is uh, Francisco Ferreira, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's event, which is entitled Our Countries Building Back Better. We've all heard of the phrase building back better in the United States, it's even legislation. So today's event is uh, to investigate whether in fact countries are building back better. The event is part of LSE's Shaping the Post-COVID World Initiative, which is a series of debates about the directions the world can and should be taking after the, the pandemic crisis. And that series of debates leads up to the LSE Festival, which is taking place uh, in June. And the topic of the festival is how do we get to the post-COVID world? So today's event is a particularly relevant build-up uh, to that festival. This evening's event will draw on a recent report uh, called From Rhetoric to Action, Delivering Equality and Inclusion uh, from the Pathfinders Initiative, which is hosted by the Center on International Cooperation at New York University, NYU. Uh, and it, the report considers what actually works to address inequality and exclusion in different country settings. Our speakers today will therefore be discussing how they or the governments or organizations to which they belong are addressing inequality and why have we not seen the scale and speed of progress that the pandemic has warranted. So uh, I'm just delighted to introduce these fabulous four speakers that we have, and I'll introduce them briefly to you in the order in which they'll speak. Their CVs are amazing, and so I could take the whole time here just introducing them, but instead I'll be very, very brief in introducing each of them. So first we'll have Minister Francis Mustafa Kaikai, who is Minister of Planning and Economic Development of Sierra Leone. In that capacity, Dr. Kaikai is also chair of the G7 plus group of fragile and conflict affected states and a co-chair of the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building. He'll be followed by Faiza Shaheen, the program lead on inequality and exclusion at the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies at that Center on International Cooperation uh, at NYU. And he's also, she's also a, professor, a visiting professor of practice here with us at LSE. Uh, she has previously been nominated as Asian Woman of the Year, one of the top 100 influencers on the left, and the Observer Campaigner of the Year. Uh, Faiza will be followed by Walid Shahid, who is a senior democratic strategist uh, for Justice Democrats. He's the spokesperson and communications director for Justice Democrats, which is a grassroots progressive organization in the United States that recruited and helped elect representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, famously known as AOC, Cory Bush, and Jamal Bowman uh, in the US and launched a campaign for a Green New Deal. He's also a member of the editorial board of The Nation. And last but not least, we'll have Professor Ha Jung Chang, who is a professor in the political economy of development at the University of Cambridge. He is a celebrated author of many important books. And in 2013, Prospect Magazine ranked him as one of the top, uh, of the top 20 world thinkers. So just some uh, housekeeping before we start. Uh, we have a live captioner and BSL interpreters at today's event, as you can see. To activate the captions, just click the CC button at the bottom of your screens. The event will run for about an hour and 30 minutes until 7.30 p.m. here London time. Um, the speakers will present for just under an hour. And as usual, there will be then the chance for uh, the audience to pose questions. Uh, when you do so, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. And if you can, state your name and affiliation where possible. Last item of business, the next public event to be held at the III is titled Civil Society, Solidarity and Emergent Agency in the time of COVID-19. So it's also relevant for the conversation today. And it will take place at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, the 23rd of February. And there will be a link uh, to that uh, in the chat. With all of that uh, and no further ado, 
Let me hand over, please, to uh, Minister Kai Kai. Uh, very happy that you are with us, Minister. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Uh, for, for such a brilliant organization. And good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this very important panel this evening to discuss the question, uh, are we building back better? In other words, we are assuming uh, there will be a post-COVID world. And in that world, we have to do better than it, it was uh, before COVID. I will focus on the Sierra Leonean case uh, because I'm most familiar with that, even though it's a global pandemic. Um, the current rate of COVID-19 infection um, is below 5% and you know, falling gradually uh, in Sierra Leone. Um, we have managed to um, manage this pandemic over the last two years uh, relatively well because uh, again of the leadership provided by uh, our government headed by President Julius Malabio. We drew from the experience of Ebola and uh, the Ebola virus disease was very terrible in Sierra Leone in 2014. I think it made global headlines. Uh, the Mano River Union countries were badly affected and uh, the whole world had to come to our rescue to survive it. Uh, and also we had to take very drastic measures internally to survive that disease. And the experience we went through has helped us greatly in the way we have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, first of all, there have been proactive measures taken you know, to, um, that will normally help to prevent the disease. Um, and also we had to develop two quick responses. One was the health response, um, which um, entailed trying to make sure we can deal with the disease and make sure infection rates are low, as low as possible. And the testing, the tracing mechanisms, all of these systems have been developed during the COVID period. So it was easier um, for us to adopt the right measures that will help us address the health uh, aspect of it. Now, we also know that diseases like this affect the social and economic lives of people. So the government also quickly put together a quick economic action response program, a co-op program. And, uh, and that program introduced many, many measures that will help to preserve lives, protect livelihoods, um, and so on of people. Because uh, immediately the disease, the disease took hold, we saw that uh, you know people could not go to their farms anymore, and uh, social life was getting affected, and so on. There are many public uh, sector uh, interactions, and um, and that um, and also public sector restrictions, which really help to you know diminish our ability to do things, and we also try to mobilize our partners and resources stay vigilant as much as possible. And uh, we were very happy that international response was overall very positive. Now, despite all this preparedness, the national, the implementation of the national development plan was adversely affected at the beginning. And so it slowed down so many things. Revenue generation deteriorated. Uh, there was huge infrastructural uh, deficits, um, which impeded economic, uh, uh, our economic programs, you know, and uh, budgetary allocations went, went down for all the sectors and our infrastructure programs were badly affected. It also affected production of uh, essential commodities and uh, inflationary pressures resulted, I mean, which really affected local markets for foods, basic foods for everybody. So the overall impact has been really very terrible uh, for us and we've not been it's been very, very bad for, for, for Syria and many countries. 
but we're able to overcome and try to stabilize things a little bit uh, somehow. Now, in terms of the vaccines, um, now talking about solutions, the vaccines they, they, is the only solution we know right now, you know, vaccination of the people. But these, uh, like many other African countries, we continue to struggle uh, for the acquisition of vaccines. Vaccines are not just easy to get. As I speak right now, uh, only 14.4% of the total population has received at least one dose. And 14.2% uh, of the target population, uh, 12 years and above, are fully vaccinated. And 8.8% of the total population are fully vaccinated. So this uh, remains a challenge for us. And, um, and we have prioritized, of course, the health workers, the military, the police, the teachers, travelers, especially at the airports and the uh, border areas, again, just to see how we can contain this, uh, this disease. Um, now, going forward, what do we need to do? Um, we have been making all kinds of uh, proposals in terms of, uh, I mean, working with our partners, working with uh, the neighboring countries in our sub-region, in ECOWAS, also in the African Union, AU. We have been proposing things to do with uh, vaccine equity, uh, how do we make sure there's greater access to vaccines, which are available more in the in the more developed world? Um, how do we make sure that uh, those vaccines acquired, they are not um, donated to us very close to the dates of expiry? Um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies to show solidarity and partnership with less established ones in Africa. Um, again, to help increase manufacturing and help with logistical issues while also preparing the global south for future outbreaks. Uh, one thing we have learned from the pandemic is that we cannot wait for charity uh, of the rich world. We need technology transfer uh, to, to the low income countries and middle income countries in order to survive this, this pandemic. Now, apart from the, the vaccine issue, we also know that there are other barriers to development, which combined with the COVID-19 response is, is a big challenge. Uh, first of all, we have to deal with a huge debt issue. Uh, managing debt levels and servicing those debts has been part of the problems for us. Um, the total debt service as, as a percentage of GDP currently um, is something like, uh, it was 14, 4% of GDP in 2021 and has risen to like 5% of GDP for 2022 uh, from the figures I mean, I have, I have so far. Now, development resources have dried up, especially for least developed countries. Um, and this is not just essential for COVID recovery, but also meeting climate goals, um, since we also have a uh, response to climate as another major burning issue. There are also issues to do with illicit financial flows still from Africa, uh, Sierra Leone inclusive, and uh, how, what can we do to minimize that? It's part of the problem. We have rising inflation also uh, globally and the transmission mechanism is through imports. And since we import a lot, so global inflation is important. And we all know also that uh, the high cost of freight, uh, freight charges for importation of goods uh, to our countries. So um, it's a challenge and we know this challenge, if it persists, it may affect achievement of the sustainable development goals, um, which um, I believe is important. Because our national plan is very much aligned to, to those goals. Um, now, we believe the international community can do more, especially in global solidarity um, for, for uh, fighting the COVID. Uh, we believe there should be more solidarity. We believe that uh, stopping illicit flow of resources of, of yeah, financial illicit financial flows sh should be tackled, and uh, the area of in the area of debt cancellation, we have been pursuing that. I mean, there is debt forgiveness, there is postponement of payments of service of the, the services, and also uh, the servicing of debts has been uh, postponed a little bit. But I mean, Africa for us, we are calling for debt cancellation. I'm being chair of the G7 plus uh, group of countries fragile countries, you know, servicing your debts in a period of the pandemic is a challenge. 
how we currently face this, this very huge challenge. And to conclude uh, this very short intervention, I only want to refer us to the Pathfinders Grand Challenge Report on Inequality and Exclusion, the flagship report. It, sh it shows us that if any country wants to build on equitable and inclusive societies, they need to subscribe to policy options that deliver visible material change, uh, build strong solidarity and secure credibility and trust in the government. But it, is also, it also reminds us that countries like Sierra Leone need action at the global level to unblock vaccines and financing. The rhetoric of building back better from the pandemic will be empty if the rich world fails to look beyond its borders. Um, I will stop my intervention there for now. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to be on the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, for that intervention. Very informative. Uh, I think we hand over to straight away to Pfizer, please. Great, thank you, um, Francisco, and, and huge thank you um, to Minister Kai Kai. Uh, when we were thinking through speakers for today, it was really important um, to us to find um, someone that could articulate the situation in the Global South, um, or at least one country in the Global South. I think here in the UK, the US and the West, in, in some ways the conversation is really, well, we're, getting, we're almost over COVID now. Um, and you know, some of us may think that that is a little premature in any, in any case, but large parts of the world, of course, haven't had the vaccines um, and are gonna struggle going forward with financing. Um, we really want this event to be a check-in on where we are. Um, of course, COVID-19 should be this inflection point at which we finally take the bold changes um, that we need to address our key challenges. And, and it's not just about today. I mean, I think so much of what we've learned from COVID is so important because of the future, for climate crisis, for other types of global crisis that we will inevitably face. Um, you know, the, the pandemic has shown us the inequalities that exist. It's shown us the importance of essential workers and, and it has shown us how interconnected we are, um, you know, from London to Sierra Leone and all over. Um, and, you know, building back better is the right sentiment. It's something that has been used all around the world and it is the right sentiment. Um, it is about learning the lessons um, and it is about looking forward. Of course, when we hear about the kind of vaccine nationalism that we see in the world today, when we hear Oxfam's new figures on billionaire wealth, and if you didn't, didn't see that, it was the top 10 riches have seen their wealth double um, since COVID, um, you know, and, and that at the same time, essential workers, most essential workers in the world have not seen a real term pay rise. And, and all of these things are in the report. Um, it's easy to feel dismayed and to feel disappointed, to feel like we haven't learned much. Um, and, and I am um, having worked in the UK for a long time and now looking internationally, I have to say that that would be the wrong conclusion because I think there are countries out there that have shown us um, that change is possible, that they can use these moments to do the right thing. Um, you know, countries like Uruguay uh, introduced a solidarity wealth tax and welfare and social protection programs around, around the world actually reduced poverty in some places during um, during COVID. Um, and South Korea, for instance, put in, put in place a new Green New Deal. So it is possible. Um, and the good, the good news is that there's nothing inevitable about the levels of inequality um, and discrimination that we see. Um, inequalities of all kinds, income, wealth, group base, they are all a product of human decisions. And I think it's easy to forget that. Um, it's easy to, to feel um, that there's not much we can do. So at Pathfinders, um, based at NYU, what we've been doing is really drawing on um, 10 countries that are involved in the program, and Sierra Leone is one of them. But interestingly, we have rich countries, middle-income countries as well, so Sweden, Canada, um, Mexico, uh, Uruguay, Costa Rica, Indonesia, to look at what they're doing on inequality and exclusion and to look at what has worked in the past or currently to address these issues. Um, and the advisory council for that work um, has been a really interesting combination of the countries. And, and thank you again to Minister Kaikai who's very much involved in that, alongside organizations like Oxfam, 
uh, ITUC, which is the International Trade Union Confederation, um, and multilaterals like the OECD and the World Bank, perhaps organizations you wouldn't expect to be around the table discussing these issues. Um, and so we've been really piecing together the equality puzzle and um, understanding um, not just the policies, the technical policies, but also the political strategies for change and the, the importance of civil society action. So I could talk through the results, um, but I'm thinking it's easier to play this animation we have of the, of the video. Um, and I know that LSE of, um, and right, thank you. Right, I'm gonna switch up for a second. During the first year of COVID-19, billionaires saw a 54% increase in wealth, equivalent to more than $4 trillion, whereas 120 million more people were pushed into extreme poverty, an unprecedented increase. There is no doubt inequalities are hampering the progress of humanity. So is inequality here to stay? Not necessarily, but to address this, we need to fully understand it. Let's look at some data. 80% of the public we've surveyed feel there are divisions in society affecting the way we live together. The vast majority think these divisions create tensions and countries are doing too little about it. Most people are bothered about the rich not paying enough tax and the majority feel that governments are largely influenced by wealthy individuals, interest groups or businesses and people like them are not listened to. It can feel like change isn't possible. But some countries have been trying new things. In Sierra Leone, community justice organizations deployed paralegals in remote and marginalized communities to help support people resolve disputes from debt to family problems. In the USA, Extra welfare support for the poorest meant that poverty fell in record numbers during the pandemic. And in Costa Rica, a national conversation was launched to ensure even the most marginalized were heard. Across the world, policies are making a difference. And according to our research, the most important policies to deliver are those that create visible change, for instance, by increasing access to affordable housing, Build solidarity between groups through social dialogue tools. Secure credibility by addressing corruption so the rich no longer rig the system. And work internationally to provide debt relief to the poorest countries. Without tackling policies like these, we cannot fix other global problems, including the climate crisis. But our research shows we can start the process of healing not only from the 2020 global pandemic, but decades of division and rampant inequality. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and that just helped shortcut me um, speaking for too long. Just a couple of things to pull out from that and, and really do have a look at the report, which details some of these policies um, in, in different categories. Um, really the polling. So the polling we did across eight countries um, involved in the study, uh, and um, it was around 17,000 people. And just a couple of things that struck me about that. I mean, we expected to get very different results in different countries, but there was almost unanimous feeling, whether low, middle or high income country, whether you know, speaking to someone in Sierra Leone or speaking to someone in Costa Rica or Canada, even in the qualitative interviews, which I listened in on, um, people are very frustrated with levels of inequality everywhere in the world, it seems. Um, and even countries that seem to be doing quite well at it, um, are finding that populations feel that the, the rich have too much say, that they're not paying enough taxes. You know, all of the things that you can imagine um, pop up um, regardless of country context, which really struck me as, as the reason why this needs to be a priority for all governments. Um, and just to reiterate the three areas of policies that are so important to understanding the countries that do move the dial on inequality so, and, and discrimination. So firstly is to um, have visible material change. And that is things like um, social protection or welfare programs, but there's also things like affordable housing. Affordable housing was 
an issue that again came up in all of those eight countries was surveyed as a problem as the issue that countries were failing at really um secondly on building solidarity and and this is about tackling those divisions in society it's about things like citizens assemblies that were tried in ireland and the work that's happening right now in costa rica and thirdly on building credibility which is about um tackling corruption, transparency of government, um, and also financing. And so I just really quickly want to just apply that to the UK. Now, for those of you that know me will know that most of my work has been here and I previously ran for the Labour Party. <laughs> you know, I didn't even write notes on this bit because it's the point at which I just want to hold my head in my hands. Um, and when you look across those three areas, uh, you can, of course, see um, that this government does accept that inequality is a problem. It has an agenda called leveling up, which is about the geographical differences across the country. Um, but on visible material change, are actually not putting enough money in. <laughs> on solidarity building, it's completely the opposite, right? We are pitted against each other in every speech. And, you know, it's London versus the rest of the UK, as if there aren't working class and the people in London. Um, it's a continual um, uh, div divisive rhetoric that we hear. So there's definitely minus points in terms of solidarity. And then on credibility, I mean, I laugh, but it's not funny. Um, you know, it's it's really not great. I mean, not parties aside, I mean, I think that the stuff around the, the PPE contracts and the lack of transparency and really just quite blatant corruption has is extremely worrying um and just just to finish to say you know looking across these countries good and bad where they are doing well um political leadership is key i mean you would expect that but it is really key um civil society organization the ability of people to come together and push back protest is really important um and thirdly political systems political systems that allow for change and with that, I think Waleed can join us from the US and talk us through what's happening there. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, the host has to allow me to share my screen and my um, video. I think it was disabled. Thank you. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, so I was asked to present on the current state of um, Build Back Better, um, which is President Biden's um, name uh, for his domestic agenda that he launched. Um, he launched the bill in like early 2021 when he was inaugurated. Um, some of it has to do with COVID recovery and some of it does not. And so I'll get into that a little bit. Um, I have a little PowerPoint. Um, and so um, I'm also just going to share some context for a lot of context for understanding President Biden's Build Back agenda, starting with um, just the realities of inequality in the United States. Um, inequality has grown rapidly since the 1980s. This is not a new story and not a unique story, um, but that's the main context that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, and President Biden has been talking about Build Back Better um, since March 2021. Um, we still have not passed Build Back Better in the United States. And um, I, I don't know how many of you are paying attention to the congressional negotiations in the United States, but um, a major reason why, uh, why Build Back Better exists and why it hasn't happened is because it's very difficult to pass laws in the United States primarily because our executive branch and our legislative branch are elected in separate elections. Um, the any, uh, it you know, legislation has to get through the House of Representatives, the Senate, uh, the president, um, as well as the Supreme, the partisan Supreme Court, which is controlled by Republicans. And so there are many veto points to stopping legislation from happening. Um, not only that, but Democrats have a strategic disadvantage in the United States Senate um, because the United States Senate overrepresents small population, largely white rural states, which are lean strongly Republican. And so 
that's how we have a system where despite the fact that California has 40 million people and all the states in yellow on that map have 40 million people, they share the same amount of senators. Um, and on the right, you can see this graph where um, that, dis, uh, that difference in population size and racial demographics um, have strongly favored the Republican party, especially in recent years. Um, another reason why it's difficult to pass legislation in the United States is because of the filibuster. Um, the filibuster uh, requires, is the ability for any one senator to essentially block any legislation and force legislation to have 60 votes instead of 50. Currently, the United States Senate is 50-50, 50 Democrats, 50 uh, Republicans. And so essentially any one um, senator can uh, use the filibuster to block um, the Democratic majority from uh, passing legislation. Um, and so it's very difficult for Democrats to have the majorities to pass laws. And it also any one Democratic senator, so maybe you've heard of Joe Manchin or Kirsten Sinema, they can also block legislation. And that is exactly what they have done. So um, getting more into Build Back Better, uh, it's a huge bill. Um, and the reason for that is because Democrats last held full control of the federal government in 2009 and 2010. Democrats have not held full control of the federal government for a decade. And since then, um, for the past 10 years, there has been a backlog of Democratic Party commitments to uh, voters, to the, to the party, uh, to the elected officials um, on a ton of uh, legislative items that uh, President Obama did not uh, uh, execute. And so um, Obama had, President Obama had three major legislative initiatives in 2009, 2010, the stimulus uh, in response to the financial crisis, the Affordable Care Act and Dodd-Frank financial regulation. Um, the federal government in the United States was not able to act on minimum wage, paid family leave, paid sick leave, childcare, elderly care, uh, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So as a result, what the Build Back Better agenda of President Biden um, was supposed to do is kind of uh, bring into action all of the things Democrats have been unable to pass for 10 years through something very arcane and difficult to understand called the reconciliation package, which allows you to once or twice a legislative session um, not require 60 votes to pass things that affect the United States budget. And so um, they have found a, uh, Democrats have found a you know, procedural way to put in a bunch of things into this legislation, which is why this bill is massive. Um, probably the number one thing in the Build Back Better agenda is uh, its climate spending and clean energy spending. Um, the reason for that is because of a combination of factors. Um, one, because of organizations like the Sunrise Movement and environmental justice organizations across the country really waged a fight over public opinion during the 2020 Democratic primaries. Um, climate change became the number two issue after healthcare and for Democratic voters. And um, there was also just in 2020 a ton of crises in the United States where uh, people are starting, many people, um, have witnessed climate change for many years, especially people on the coasts and in Puerto Rico, but for many um, other Americans, uh, the wildfires and the floods of 2020 were really drastic and began to shift public opinion on that. Um, President Biden also has a self-interest to represent the United States uh, respectfully on the world stage and that matters to him. And so um, you end up getting climate spending as one of the number one one of the biggest items within the Build Back Better agenda. Um, and there were lots of negotiations during the 2020 primaries to uh, negotiate publicly the Democratic Party's climate portion. Um, Bernie Sanders had a $16 trillion climate plan. Um, eventually Biden uh, appointed Bernie and AOC to a task force, which uh, basically created a democratic coalition around a more progressive climate plan. Um, Biden initially only wanted to spend 1.7 trillion. Um, and all of that leads to the Biden governance agenda, which was the Build Back Better $3.5 trillion agenda, which had all of these items in it, such as creating free and universal pre-K, making the child tax credit permanent, 
uh, which would cut child poverty in half in the United States, allow the government to finally negotiate the price of prescription drug costs for seniors. I know this doesn't really, uh, this is probably crazy to people in the United Kingdom, but allow uh, seniors above uh, the age of 60 to uh, be eligible for free healthcare, um, and several, several other items in here that I won't go into. Um, and uh, since that was unveiled, there has been a lot of obstruction from conservative Democrats in the party, and every piece of Build Back Better that is in red here has been eliminated. Um, the yellow is still a conversation. The green is likely to be included, and the orange is likely to be nixed. And so uh, President Biden, basically, there has been a whole competition over what uh, gets put in Build Back Better at this point. Um, it's really unfortunate uh, that Manchin has said that Build Back Better is dead. He has effect effectively killed the bill as we know it. Um, and we don't know where Democrats are going to go next. Um, and, you know, Joe Manchin and also conservative Democrat Kirsten Sinema have uh, cozy relationships with many uh, corrupt corporate actors. They take donations from oil companies and pharmaceutical companies. Um, Joe Manchin has a view of the child tax credit that people would spend the money that they've received from the child tax credit on drugs. Um, these are ideological debates happening in the Democratic Party, but that is, you know, a little context for why Joe Manchin thinks the way he does. Um, but to uh, talk about some positive developments as Build Back Better continues to be pulverized and remains in stasis, um, the United States actually has seen uh, much larger income growth since the pandemic, um, in large part because the United States had a very large fiscal response uh, to the pandemic. Um, and a plethora of temporary programs that were conducted in the pandemic help low, America, low income Americans weather the pandemic in 2021 um, and extending that people have a kind of a idea that extending them would be a meaningful step toward building an economy that works for everyone. And so you can see in this graph here that um, child poverty has actually gone really, really down in the United States from 25% to uh, a little over 10% um, because of the child tax credit that is currently on the chopping block of the Build Back um, Better negotiations. Um, uh, the United States also effectively raised the wages of many uh, low income workers by providing unemployment insurance that was higher than the minimum wage. And so you can see uh, that what the effect of that was in the graph. Um, and so what many people are saying is that United States welfare state remains very weak, but our fiscal state ha has been a remarkable success. I mean, this was the, uh, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury pumping a lot of money into the US economy and also um, having uh, get the Democrats being able to uh, create this unemployment insurance program that was set at $15 an hour, even though the minimum wage in the United States is $7.25. Um, that has been part of the conversation about why there's a quote labor shortage in the United States. Um, most economists have said that it's not that there's a labor shortage in the United States, it's that workers realize that there weren't, they were working in shitty, uh, shitty jobs um, without any affordable childcare, without, without any uh, living wage. Um, and because of the experiments conducted during the pandemic from the US uh, government, um, it, workers had an experience of earning more money at $15 an hour than they did beforehand. And so now workers are using their labor power to negotiate for better jobs. Um, employers who pay $15 an hour have not had as much of an issue attracting workers. Um, I'm going to end there because uh, I know that was a lot and I'm over my time, but that's some context to some of the ways that um, inequality and uh, remedies to it are shaping um, politics in the United States right now. Yes, Hajun. Uh, uh... Thank you, Walid, and uh, we turn over straight away to Hajun Chan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think uh, that we are all a bit frustrated by the fact that the experience of COVID-19 pandemic has not brought about uh, as much as many changes as uh, that we thought uh, that they would. But I think that, that uh, I, I would uh, kind of uh, 
chime what uh, Faiza and Walid uh, have said. You know, yeah, I mean that uh, we haven't seen as many changes as, uh, as uh, we hope for. I think uh, that uh, we are that uh, seeing changes and uh, some of them quite unexpected, like uh, the rising uh, the, the wages in the US are uh, falling poverty there. And uh, the, all these uh, programs, uh, the, the progressive programs are implemented in countries like Uruguay, Costa Rica, Sierra Leone, as uh, seen in the Pfizer's video, you know, the build back better in the US, uh, Green New Deal in the South Korea, election of uh, Gabriel Boric uh, in Chile, so I think uh, we are actually uh, seeing quite a lot of uh, changes. Of course, uh, that many of these are quite precarious because, uh, for example, in Korea, that uh, you know, the, in the, the presidential election in March, you could have a very conservative uh, candidate uh, who want to take the country back to the 1960s, if not the 19th century, could win, and a lot of uh, Green New Deal programs will be scrapped and. The, the you know the, the some people are worried that the, the, the Republicans might uh, take the uh, Congress back uh, the, in the midterm election uh, later this year. So I think that uh, we uh, really need to uh, think about uh, the ways in which uh, we can consolidate uh, some of the positive uh, changes that have happened. And I think that uh, the the Pathfinder's uh, report uh, give us a lot of uh, very important information on how we can uh, make that happen. So I think that uh, we, uh, I would uh, like to just uh, make a few points on how I think uh, we need to uh, take this forward. I think first of all, we need to recognize that uh, the corona pandemic experience actually has uh, changed uh, people's perspective quite a lot. Once again, not as much as that uh, you hope for, but for example, that, that, that we have become more aware of uh, common destiny of uh, humankind. You know, the, at the national level, we realize so it is important. Universal uh, social protection is important. We have realized that uh, the, the global communities are bound in. Uh, a single destiny when uh, things like a pandemic and uh, by implication, the climate change uh, the, uh, uh, the facing us. So I think that we have uh, seen people realizing that uh, you cannot just uh, exist as uh, individuals or groups. Also, we have uh, in realized the importance of uh, the, the care economy or more broadly the, the reproductive economy through this experience. We have uh, realized the importance of uh, universal social protection, you know, unless everyone is safe, no one is uh, the, truly safe. So I think uh, the, there are all these uh, the, the important changes in the perspectives that uh, this uh, experience has uh, brought about. But uh, as I said, uh, these are quite precarious. So we need to uh, the, the find ways to the consolidate uh, this uh, the shift uh, in the positive direction. And once again, I mean, the, the past finders uh, the report uh, give us uh, the, some very useful, interesting tips. Yeah, I mean, we the, first of all need to change uh, the, the narrative. I don't know, it could uh, the, the be something very grand, but uh, you know, the, the could be something that just uh, catch uh, people's uh, the eyes, you know, the, the, uh, in, in his uh, presentation, Walid was uh, the, the referring the, uh, the, to the Republican party as uh, GOP, the so-called grand old party, but actually, the, you know, you could uh, the start by saying that uh, that is a, misrepresentation because uh, the Republican Party was set, set up only in 19, 1860, uh, just before the election in which uh, Abraham Lincoln won, while the Democratic Party had existed in one form or another from the beginning of the Republic. So, you know, somehow the, by calling themselves uh, the GOP, the Republicans that uh, the pretended that they are the natural party of government, that's not true. So it could be something that, that 
uh, small but uh, quite important like uh, that. But yes, I mean, we need to uh, build this uh, new narrative uh, built around the importance of uh, the common uh, destiny, mutual in independence, importance of uh, caring for each other, you know, importance of uh, protecting everyone. So the, the changes in narratives is uh, very important. And then uh, we need to build new social movement, uh, new political movement. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the way the, the left wing of the Democratic Party in the US uh, the have uh, the built up uh, the momentum. Of course, uh, the, the, the peculiarities of uh, the US uh, political system has uh, meant that a couple of uh, conservative uh, senators uh, could uh, completely that, uh, destroy the, the, these progresses. But still, I mean, that, that these things will leave uh, legacies behind. Then I think that, that uh, other countries could uh, really learn from that uh, experience. Uh, we need to build uh, the new political and social movements because uh, you know, the, the existing uh, the, the political system, but uh, institutions of uh, social control, uh, they have been uh, basically captured by the, the top uh, the, the 1%, if not top 0.1%. And then uh, I think uh, in the, doing all of this, uh, the, uh, personally, I think uh, that this experience has uh, shown us uh, the importance of regulating the media not just the traditional media, but uh, the so-called social media, because a lot of uh, these uh, social divisions have been created by the campaign of uh, misinformation and uh, misrepresentation. So, you know, the, when the people should be angry towards the conservative government in the UK for failing uh, to control the, the pandemic, you know, the, for example, the, in the UK, uh, the 237 people per 100,000 people died of COVID, whereas in South Korea, only 13 people died, you know, it's a complete uh, failure. And uh, somehow the, that is uh, the, the, not uh, really a fatal issue for this government because they have uh, created so many other kind of uh, the, the false narratives and that the uh, spread that uh, uh, so many the uh, misinformation with the help of uh, the uh, the the media the uh, both traditional and social that uh, essentially controlled by the top uh, 0 0.1 percent so i think that uh, you know i'm not uh, a kind of a uh, uh, political scientist or social sociologist but you know the, uh, even the foreign economies it uh, seems very clear that uh, the battle is really in the, the building social movements, uh, coming up with uh, the, the workable, sustainable the policy alternatives, rather than you know that the, the, with the data showing it is like this, uh, it should be like that, because that unless uh, that you control the narratives, unless you build the, the social and political movements and regulate the media. You know, the, all the good uh, academic research that uh, the, the people the, in the academia do that, that could be just uh, wasted. Okay, let me uh, stop there. I think I've just uh, uh, used up my time. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to the four of you for uh, for excellent interventions and, and quite different uh, from one another, so quite complementary. I think uh, the idea now is that you would uh, appear on the panel again, so I hope that uh, we'll soon be able to see your on camera. Um, so let me just say uh, that now the floor is open to questions from the audience, so uh, we have a lot of people in the audience, uh, you know, please feel free to pose your questions uh, on the chat. And I'll start with a number of questions that are already there on the chat. Um, and for this first round of questions, what I'd like to do is, uh, is ask uh, specific questions uh, to specific individuals. Um, they are either already uh, um, asked of specific individuals or I will direct them to specific individuals. And then later on, we may have uh, some opportunity for 
um, interaction amongst you uh, panel members. So the first question is for Minister Kai Kai, uh, whom we can't yet see back on screen, but hopefully he's there. Uh, I'm going to read the four questions. Uh, there you are. Thank you very much, Minister. So I'm going to read the four questions uh, all together and then go over to you in this order, okay? So for Minister Kai Kai, there's a question from Leandro Franco. It says, thank you for your presentation. And then asks, what's the main strategy for Sierra Leone to promote inclusion of people in the productive sector in the context of building back better? How is this strategy related with the development strategy for the country? For Pfizer, I'd like to ask this question here by Raj Tamotaram, uh, who says, says, it seems easier to talk about vaccine nationalism than vaccine neoliberalism. It's perfectly clear that shareholder value primacy is a driving factor of vaccine inequity as much as nationalism. What can academics, and I'll add, um, or others, do to help a more authentic and comprehensive conversation, which doesn't exclude one key factor, like, uh, like uh, shareholder value primacy, I guess, and where capitalism is recoupled with public health needs. So that was for Pfizer. And then as I scroll down here, uh, I have for Walid, uh, I have one from Vijay Srao, who asks, to what extent is inequality in the West caused by the rise of China? Is inequality and in regional poverty here to stay unless the US and EU engage in a trade war of China, protectionism, tariff and non-tariff barriers? So that's for Walid. And uh, there is one for Professor Hajun, from Salma Ibrahim, uh, who is an LSC MSc student. And she asks, can you share some thoughts on the effect of COVID-19 on refugee inequalities and how we can reverse this effect? So those are quite interesting questions I thought. So let's uh, maybe start with the minister and then go in the same order as before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. And thanks very much to uh, those asking the questions. I think overall is, uh, I need to probably say that a couple of things very quickly then I can go straight to the question. Number one, you know, for low income countries and for, you know, the, the G7 plus countries um, for us, the issue of fragility is, is, is really come to the fore again. Fragility has increased uh, generally with the pandemic. And, uh, and what that means is inequality is not being adequately tackled because the ability to do so has been really grossly affected you know, by the pandemic. And this is also leading to exclusion in many ways in many of these countries. You know, so therefore the ability of governments to uh, you know, respect the social contracts they have with their citizens, you know, the, the, the ability to really meet those contracts I mean, it's becoming more and more constrained, I mean, with time. And therefore, it's important that we, we really try very hard to, to tackle this pandemic because it's going to create even more challenges, I mean, over time, if it, if it is not. Now, on the question of inclusion in the productive sector, um, you know, this is an interesting question because uh, Sierra Leone already had a, a national development plan. We call it the medium-term national development plan running from 2019 to uh, 2023. Now, it was right at the beginning of delivering on this uh, particular document uh, plan that the, the pandemic came. And uh, so it has slowed us down generally. And one of the main pillars of, of this plan is the competitiveness of, competitiveness of the economy and growing the productive sector you know, for economic growth. And, um, and this, the sectors, particularly agriculture, uh, fisheries, I mean, these have the majority of the citizens. Agriculture is the mainstay of our economy and the majority of people are in that sector. So once you don't invest in that sector, it means you are going to in increase uh, exclusivity. So a lot of people are excluded you know, from the economy 
uh, and so on and, and so forth. Once we fail to invest in infrastructure and infrastructure that will help boost production, the more people are going to find it very difficult to uh, participate um, there. Now, we saw a bit of that. And part of our uh, quick response program, economic response program, was to actually find a way to boost infrastructure, especially in the, in the product, productive areas, the rice production areas, the cocoa production areas, and areas that are generally productive areas uh, in the areas of fisheries, uh, in tourism, because tourism is increasingly being productive as well and contributing to the economy, and also in areas where we have mining activities, which are all contributing to the economy. Um, we have tried to do a lot there, and, but there is still a lot to do um, to make sure that we can attract more and more investments in those areas, to attract investments in agriculture. This is taking place now as we speak. Uh, the last uh, one year, we have seen more investment now in agriculture, more participation in agriculture. We have tried to have youth programs in agriculture, youths um, in agriculture, youths in fisheries, uh, try to encourage the youthful population to be in those sectors a bit more so that they can produce uh, more and also get interested in agriculture so that we don't leave that sector to all the old population. I mean, who can no longer really feed themselves and the rest of the population. So um, this has happened, but we need to do more. And uh, we are very mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, these are large sectors. And uh, by trying to encourage more participation, you are actually, you know, encouraging more and more inclusion uh, into, the, into the economic space. And, and I think that is really very important. So this is actually part of our national plan. And, uh, and the national plan, Itself focus on human capital development, um, which is trying to get more and more people educated. Free education has been introduced at the lower levels, the basic levels. There is more emphasis on skills training as well at the tertiary level. Uh, for people who don't go to universities, we are looking for outlets for them for more training to participate in the economy. And these are part of the national development plan um, and so on. Now, we need more and more investment in this as well and uh, but the pandemic continues to be a real challenge because we are not generating enough domestic revenue to actually invest in those sectors uh, we are working very hard with development partners and so on and uh, i think uh, thanks to many of uh, them they are doing well i mean even though we see a reduction in uh, development assistance from many countries uh, our, including the UK, and we hope there will be a reversal here. Um, but I hope that uh, you know the reversal will lead to more participation, you know, by these countries. But we have a very clear plan, a very clear pathway with human capital development, with uh, investments in the productive sectors, uh, investments in women, uh, investments in the vulnerable, um, uh, and so on, and investments in the youths, of course, you know, as part of the national. Uh, transformation plan. This plan is on course, it's slow because of the pandemic. We are not generating enough revenue uh, to do it, but clearly, um, you know, we're doing our best to make sure that we can uh, make sure we do things that will not exclude as many people as possible. Because we even have social protection programs, you know, for the poor uh, and so on. So we need more and more of these programs implemented. And once implemented, we believe that we'll be able to tackle a good part of the exclusion challenge, you know, that as reported uh, by the Pathfinder's report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much. I'm going to ask the, the Minister gets a special dispensation, but I'm going to ask the next three of you to give brief answers, please. So, Faisa. <laughs> Okay, so briefly, um, thank you for that question, Raj. Um, 100%, it's not just vaccine nationalism. Uh, it's not just vaccine nationalism, it is, of course, vaccine neoliberalism. And um, I think it's important, though, to think about both those things, because the way we see it playing out, of course, there's the influence of big pharma um, on decision making in, in rich countries, um, on the ability to really uh, set um, how um, international, um, the TRIPS waiver, the international 
um, patents work when it comes to pharma. And, and, and that is that is a big problem. Um, and it's extremely frustrating. But there is also vaccine nationalism um, because countries, you saw this with um, Omicron, in fact. Um, so countries that had pledged to, to send a certain number of vaccines to countries, um, Omicron kicks in. They said, no, we're going to hoard some of these. And you could see it in the numbers because we're doing a booster campaign. So rather than um, what we said we were going to send to other countries, we're going to hold on to these because of course, politicians are thinking about their domestic populations. Now, that's not an excuse. What should happen is we should allow um, companies, manufacturers um, in low and middle income countries to produce the vaccine. Um, you, we need to waive the TRIPS, um, the TRIPS waiver. We need to make sure that um, the know-how and the technology is transferred. Now, Sometimes I hear countries uh, and, and pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer respond to these um, uh, these recommendations and say, "Oh well, there's not there's not manufacturers ready." There's a really great report out by Medicines Sans Frontieres in December showing there's a hundred um, pot potential facilities that could start uh, manufacturing vaccines um, all around the world. Um, and so. This is just a, a block that happens um, from these companies unwilling to share. Um, and it really, it really, I'm really worried about this, to be honest. Um, I don't think we have had the type of shift that we should have on this, um, you know, especially after Omicron, especially the way in which the world shut down to Southern African countries when South Africa did the right thing and reported um, the Omicron vari variant. And this is where we really need to be pushing, pushing our political leaders. Um, and I know that there is a summit coming up at the UN um, on the 25th of February, and we're working with um, Costa Rica and others um, in the Pathfinders um, countries to, to really push this point um, that we've learned the lesson. How many times do we need to learn this lesson? Um, and it's time to do that transfer of technology and allow others to, um, others to um, also produce the vaccine. You know, it ultimately comes down to greed. Um, and the only thing that really helps with greed is um, uh, the force of people. So, you know, we need that collective action to, to push back. But yeah, it's absolutely both vaccine nationalism and vaccine neoliberalism coming together to really uh, lock this in. Thanks, Pfizer. Walid? Um Thank you for your question. Um, I want to preface by saying I'm definitely not an expert on US-China uh, policy, but I definitely do not blame um, or hold. I don't think China is to blame for inequality in the United States. Um, a lot of the policy, a lot of the inequality in the United States comes from the 1970s, 1980s. China had no involvement in the policies passed by Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton to lower the corporate tax rate, lower the tax rate on the 1%. Um, globe, uh, in the United States um, and regulations on private businesses that used to be there um, and decimate trade unions in the United States. Um, those are all policies made by American officials. Um, you know, that said, uh, obviously, the, the, their, President Biden has engaged in heavy rhetoric with China that a lot of progressives find alarming. There's a lot of Cold War rhetoric coming from President Biden. Um, about uh, the Chinese government. And um, I'm not sure that that sort of rhetoric is helpful for, you know, comment. Obviously, you know, the United States has its criticisms of China and so do progressives, but um, it, it, it does feel like, uh, you know, both countries benefit from blaming, both countries benefit domestically by blaming the other one for things that they could maybe work together on, especially on the climate crisis. Um, and lastly, I'll just say that, you know, there has, since the 1970s, there has been a, uh, a lot of the manufacturing done in the United States has moved to countries like China and the US has increasingly financialized our economy. The only thing we create is, uh, you know, Wall Street hedge funds. And so there has been a large discussion in the United States on how to create a more productive economy based in a clean energy economy so that um, the, that the only, asset or wealth that the United States generates is not just more and more mortgage-backed securities or financial instruments or tools like this, but something that actually is productive um, and has wealth beyond just uh, uh, increasingly you know, engaging in exploitative practices. So I'll end there and pass it on. Thank you. Arjun? Yes, uh, I'm not sure what uh, 
the question means by refugee inequalities, but that in relation to COVID-19, I would interpret it as uh, meaning that uh, people with uh, uncertain immigration status were afraid uh, to kind of uh, get uh, tested or uh, get vaccinated uh, because they were afraid of kind of uh, uh, getting caught uh, in the process and being uh, prose uh, prosecuted. So yeah, if uh, the, that was uh, what the, the question was that, that, uh, thinking about, you know, there, there was some societies uh, where they just that, that told the, that, uh, told the uh, people that, that uh, don't worry about your immigration status. We are not going to uh, pursue that when you come uh, for testing and vaccination. So I think uh, that, that that was a wise thing to do because that, uh, you know, the, the, the whole point of uh, all of this uh, uh, test uh, trace that uh, uh, isolate the uh, vaccine program is uh, to cover as many people as possible. So I think uh, that the more general lesson is that, that, that through this uh, experience, we have uh, learned the importance of uh, universality, uh, the, at least uh, when it comes to the, the uh, things like uh, the pandemic and climate change and so on that, that, that affect everyone. So that, uh, just a brief uh, comment on the, how the, this uh, work uh, the, in, even in countries like uh, South Korea, which has been very successful in the, the delivering it, the COVID-19, you know, the country has an exceptionally high proportion of people in uh, self-employment, uh, given its uh, level of income. You know, about 25% of labor force is uh, in uh, self-employment, whereas the, the European average is about 15%. And it's uh, only about six percent in the U.S. So the, the government uh, could not actually the, the reach people the, the in self-employment uh, in effective forms because that uh, they are not covered by the, the regular the social welfare programs. I mean, the South Korea has a very poor welfare state, you know, accounting for only about the 11, 12 percent of GDP compared even to the U.S., uh, which uh, spends about 19 percent. This is very small. But even for that, that uh, small welfare state, you know, the people in self-employment was uh, very poorly covered and they were uh, very hard hit because uh, many of them are running restaurants and bars and so on, which had uh, some but uh, restrictions. I mean, South Korea never shut down uh, completely because it uh, did this uh, test uh, and trace uh, program so successfully, but, you know, they were the uh, uh, curfews and so on. So, uh, these people are very hard hit and uh, now that they are talking about uh, introducing if you like uh, un unemployment insurance uh, program for self-employed people so i think that uh, through this experience a lot of uh, the, us uh, have uh, uh, recognized the importance of uh, universality in the various uh, programs and i think uh, that's uh, one positive lesson that we should all pick up thank you great thanks very much for the next round, um, I think I'm also many of the questions are directed and aimed at specific speakers. So um, I will do that again. I'll, I'll ask a question for each of you, but I'd like you to feel free to chip in on other questions that you hear. So if you hear a question addressed to one of you, but you would like uh, somebody else would like to chip in as well, uh, please feel free to do that. So um, here's a selection. So again, let me start with a, a question for Minister Kai Kai. What role does the panel see MDBs, multilateral development banks, playing in building back better? What opportunities have potentially been missed to date? And then specifically, as the EBRD considers a potential expansion to sub-Saharan Africa, do you see a role for further private sector complementary, complementary engagement in the region? This was from um, Evan Farrow. Then a question to uh, Hajun. Um, with the pandemic, debt levels rose globally, but especially in developing countries. Do you expect a new wave of austerity and other counterproductive conditionalities imposed on developing countries by the IMF in this sense? And if so, does this lead us into the same vicious circle? That's from Nato Balavadze. Then, uh, 
where is my question to Walid? You know, this, this thing is uh, difficult. I had a question for Walid here. Uh, we have to decenter the United States sometimes, you know. Just, uh, <laughs> we take up too much space. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm uh, uh, so I'm gonna let the last question, which I was going to, to um, I was going to, <laughs> to target at uh, at Pfizer, but I'll let you uh, respond as well, Walid, since both of you are kind of mentioned implicitly here. This is a question that has the most votes so far by Anya Ekpo, who's an LSE alumna, she says there are two representative activists here from left political parties and their assumed grassroots. Is this party approach not a failed concept for social movements? See, for example, BLM, climate and women's. So let you both think about that and let's start again with the minister. Let's go, this time we'll go the minister, uh, Kai Kai, then Hajun, then Walid and Faisal, okay? Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much. I'll be really very brief uh, this time on this because I, it's very straightforward uh, for me. Um, I will sit thumbs up for multilateral development plans. Um, they've been very much involved in our development process. Um, they already endorsed our medium-term national development plan, uh, I have to say, and uh, they've not backed away from that plan. And I think, uh, you know, since the inception of, uh, of COVID, uh, they've never backed down. The projects that have been identified for implementation, uh, they've provided resources for them and we found a way, you know, to, to carry them through, uh, even though a bit uh, slowly. Uh, in addition, um, the banks have also tried to make provisions for social protection. You know, social protection is a key area for social inclusion uh, to tackle the issue of inequality uh, and so on. And I think, uh, you know, just on those two, I mean, I'll really give a, a, a pass, you know, to the multilateral development banks, and they continue to be very important. I mean, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, and, and others, you know, they've all been very much, uh, very much in, 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 in control. I mean, the only, the, the only thing that, it's not a bank, but the IMF has also been with us. And the IMF is a bit controlling because uh, they, they've created a debt ceiling for us. Uh, we cannot go out there and borrow more, uh, even take loans for our own, uh, for investments in infrastructure and other key areas. Uh, you know, there are views on this, which, um, you know, which, again, on the radical side, we have, uh, you know, colleagues who think this is really problematic because, I mean, being a poor country, um, yes, we have to manage our debts and debt servicing is really a huge drag on us uh, right now. So we need uh, the support provided by the IMF, you know, to uh, make sure we can cushion you know, the impact of COVID for now. But we hope down the line, they will also be able to uh, look at the debt situation and see how best they can assist us, you know, to have the way to, to go on for loans. Um, for the private sector, uh, the private sector is playing a key role. For now, Sierra Leone's private sector remains really small. But we want the international private sector to come in here as well. But we had good prospects. But then once the pandemic hit, uh, we saw them also making a series of reversals. I mean, they couldn't come forward as, as planned and it's a bit slow for now. Um, so the private sector rely on uh, mainly Sierra Leone and private sector, uh, but they remain small really. And their impact could be great. Um, you know, once they have the, the, uh, the support they need. But in a pandemic situation, you know, they are very, very much risk averse. They are not investing as much as we would expect, you know, under the current circumstances. But nonetheless, their role is important and the government has given them really the space to do business and the country is open for business. So we also are looking forward to more partners to um, come invest in Sierra Leone, especially in agriculture, in mining, in tourism. Um, there are great prospects here still. Um, you know, I can safely use this platform to really make that really very clear. 
So the role of the private sector is very much on us, and we're looking forward to more participation, especially from the international uh, private sector partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Ahaju? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the pandemic has meant that a lot of countries have uh, run uh, quite big debt, and it is uh, the, the legitimate uh, to worry that this might lead to a wave of austerity, but I really urge uh, that uh, the IMF and the other institutions uh, who are in charge of uh, the financing uh, the developing countries to take a totally different approach, you know, that uh, I think uh, we should think back uh, the days after the Second World War, you know, that, that Britain had that, that, that public debt to GDP ratio of uh, nearly 300%. And that uh, most countries were, in that sense, bankrupt in Europe. Initially, the Americans that uh, tried to make them pay back, and then uh, soon realized that this was uh, that uh, going to destroy the European and then the world economy. So they uh, implemented the Marshall Plan, and then they implemented that uh, set up the IMF so that actually countries can that, that uh, run down their debt uh, without that uh, going into austerity. Unfortunately, in the 1980s, the neoliberal takeover has meant that the IMF that uh, has been doing the exact opposite of what it has been doing and imposing austerity that, uh, on countries that, that, that with that uh, public finance program. And yeah, we, we, we've seen how it doesn't work, you know, that uh, recently that uh, in the Eurozone crisis, I mean, countries like Greece was uh, made to cut public debt, that, uh, sorry, spending hugely in the name of uh, cutting public debt. And then it, uh, the, but the debt to GDP ratio that uh, even rose because GDP was collapsing. So the, we shouldn't repeat that mistake. And, you know, the, to be fair, I think uh, the IMF has also learned from that experience and has been less uh, the, the, the kind of demanding in terms of uh, austerity policies uh, compared to the 80s and 90s, but still it has uh, some way to go. And I think uh, that, you know, that if uh, the, the IMF and other global financial institutions that uh, try to uh, uh, impose the austerity program on developing countries, it will be a disaster. Especially, let's not forget that we are not talking about the one country or, you know, 190 that is in financial trouble. I mean, we are talking about dozens of countries. If all of these countries went into austerity drive, we will actually that uh, severely damage the global economy. So it's uh, in the interest even of the uh, rich countries that control the IMF uh, that, uh, to, to let these uh, countries uh, run down their public debt over a long time. I mean, just, uh, let me just uh, finish by adding that Britain repaid its uh, Second World War debt uh, completely only in something like 2015. Yeah? I mean, it took them 50 years, that, uh, 60 years to do that. Yeah? So let's, uh, that, that, uh, sorry, 70 years to do that. So that, uh, let's uh, that, uh, treat this as uh, a huge emergency like uh, that, uh, the Second World War and uh, take a different approach. Thank you. Thanks, Hajun. Uh, let's go over to Walid now. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, you know, this is a question that's been debated by people on the left and progressives for almost a century is, uh, you know, how you enact political change. Do you engage with political, do should social movements engage with political parties? Um, should they enter political parties? And, you know, the really the left movement, the progressive movement in the United States has really entered the political scene after being in the wilderness for a long time since the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. Um, so it's a six year project. Um, it's a still pretty young left, even though even if Bernie Sanders himself is old, his, his supporters, his base are pretty young. Um, there's a big divide between voters over the age of 45 and under 45 in every poll that you do in the United States. So I think we're, even though everything, you know, acting on climate change is uh, a major urgent issue that should have been done years ago. And acting on the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement, racial justice are urgent. I would still say that um, this movement is very young. Um, I think it's, it um, will take, take, a, take time to grow. In terms of the seats that the left controls in the Congress, it's very few seats, um, you know, maybe two or three senators and maybe 
six to 15 House of out of 435 representatives. And so um, I'm still hopeful because we've already been able to have an effect. Um, but, you know, I'm only 31 and <laughs> I still have a couple of years left. And so I hope to increase um, increase the power of this movement. But obviously, pe people are really, especially um, young people and like um, President Biden's approval ratings are very low for a Democrat with um, with young people. They're low. I mean, his approval ratings are almost the same as Donald Trump's were, which, you know, I think is hard for some people to believe. But with uh, young people, especially Democrats tend to be popular. President Obama was very popular with young people. Um, Biden is below 50 percent with uh, voters under 30. And um, I think that'll be a problem for Democrats if he isn't able to deliver on the things that young people care about, most specifically the climate crisis. And so, um, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. I gave you two. I gave you two things there. So I'll pass it back. Thank you. I I don't see Pfizer anymore. I don't know if she had a some sort of technical. Oh, there she's coming back. Uh, so let's give her a moment. Hi, Pfizer. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm sorry. The internet decided to go at that moment. No, no problem. Do you remember the question that I had asked you? Yes, I remember the question. I did want to say something quickly um, about, and sorry, I, Walid, I don't know your answer to that question, so I don't know how this will follow, but just something quickly I wanted to say about debt, the debt issue, and I think this is a really critical problem, and I think, um, you know, the IMF and others need to look, just to agree with Harjun Chang, to, that they need to look very carefully at what they're doing on this, you know, you already have countries like Zambia paying 44% of its annual revenue to creditors every year. I mean, you just can see in so many countries across the world, they're really on the edge. And in part, they've been able to stay in the game because certain repayments have been paused. Now, when those payments are unpaused, they are really gonna struggle to keep up with progress on education and health, et cetera. Even those governments with all of the, you know, the great ideas and the amazing plans are going to struggle with financing. Um, of course, we did have debt cancellation, with the Jubilee debt cancellation back in, what was it, 2004? Um, and, you know, that was, that was a massive campaign, a global campaign that really shifted things. And I think we need to look again um, as a movement um, as people, um, and it does come back to this, to see how we can support um, the global South, because it's it's frustrating that we're not really seeing anything on that global debt problem. Um, and there is, this is gonna sound a bit technical, but look it up, there are, and this is where, again, there's some criticism for the IMF. Um, there's, the system, there's the SDRs, which are essentially a, a global reserve that the IMF hold, um, and 650 billion pounds have been released through that. Most of that goes to the rich world. A very small percentage will go to low-income countries. But that is a really um, amazing resource for countries like the UK um, and other rich countries to say, well, this is extra money that we weren't expecting. Let's redistribute this um, to low and middle income countries to support in building back better globally and learning the lessons of COVID. Um, so just, you know, there are some key financing issues coming up that we need to familiarize ourselves with, because otherwise these things go under the radar. And where the money is going to come from, of course, is, is really critical. And we really must fight um, austerity measures everywhere in the, in the world when we know that we need huge investments um, at this time. And very quickly on that question, and, and I think it relates to, to some other questions that came up. I mean, 100% um, like, of course, BLM, women's movement, climate, um, you know, Fridays for the future. These are incredible movements um, born out of um, the kind of core political sphere that actually have huge influence then on, on certain politicians. And I say certain, and this is where I mean to say that politics, you know, traditional politics still matters. Um, because, you know, if you don't have the AOCs, if you don't have some of these po politicians that you can, you can influence that will listen, then you won't see some of that change converted into the bills, uh, the legal change that we need to see at the government level. So, you know, 100% for all of the grassroots action um, and, and huge support to, to BLM and climate action and women's groups, etc. But yeah, we need both to work in together. Thanks very much, Faisal. So now, you know, we're about to run out of time. I'm going to um, ask 
uh, one final question, the one that has the most votes here, and then invite each of you in about a minute and a half each uh, to sort of either answer that or offer your final remarks and, and comments. Okay, we, we, we have so many questions because the panel has been so rich and I'm sorry I can't get through all of them. But here's the one from Donna Carmichael, a PhD student at LSE. She says, the rise of finance and the liberalization of financial markets over the last 40 years have been major contributors to the increasing levels of inequality. For example, exorbitant salaries and bonuses in the finance sector, the financialization of housing has driven up house prices astronomically, rise of esoteric investment vehicles for the wealthy, et cetera. How can policy address inequality when finance exerts massive power over the economy? So with that and uh, uh, opportunity to comment on, 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 on any final remarks, but quite briefly, let me go to uh, the minister first again. Yeah, hello. Um, I think, um, you know, that, that's a it's, a, it's a very broad comment there from Mr. Kaimapo. And I think uh, he's actually right. I mean, when I, when I think of uh, what is going on in, in uh, you know, in, in low income countries, uh, including uh, mine, uh, I think some costs, some cost saving can take place. I mean, that is for sure. Uh, but whatever cost we save, I think will not be really enough to, uh, to fill our investment needs, uh, what we need to invest in infrastructure uh, and so on. So uh, and which we really need to unlock our economies. I mean, the, the fact is our productive sectors still need to be unlocked and uh, so that we can create more jobs, we can create more opportunities for people and fight um, exclusion. You know, we need to do that. And um, so part of it, of course, is trying to tackle some of these costs. And I agree with him. Uh, clearly, I agree with the questioner. questioner. Uh, and I agree with the concepts, the general trend is asking the question. Um, I mean, it's very much like saying the rich are getting richer and the poor getting poorer. You know, that's really what he's saying there. And I think he's generally right. And the pandemic has really given a lot of uh, indicators there to, um, for us to conclude that way. You know, so overall, I do agree with what he's saying. And I think... Uh, you know, inequalities with us and to be able to really tackle that. Um, I think there is a lot we can do internally, you know, as uh, low income countries, um, the G7 countries, there is a lot we should do to tackle corruption, to tackle waste, to tackle so many things, you know, but at the same time, we need to make sure there is really global solidarity uh, in terms of trying to see how best, you know, to tackle inequality and exclusion. And, um, and once again, I want to thank the panelists. I mean, I, I learned a lot from the ideas they have propounded and some of the ways they are thinking. I think um, I can relate to them, you know, being a development minister myself, coming from uh, a low income country, I can relate to a lot of the things they say. But once again, thank you very much. There isn't much time to really debate so much on, on these issues, uh, but I appreciate so much the opportunity to uh, share some views. And hear Thank views from panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Over Thank to you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Kai Kai. Thank you very much. Um, we'll we'll go over to Pfizer now, then Walid and then Haju. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent again. I mean, there's some really good questions here. Financialization is the key driver when you look at um, regression models of what's driven inequality, especially in the West, you see financialization and deunionization. So again, people power, um, are the two key drivers of inequality. And of course, when we talk about billionaire wealth, that's partly about asset inflation. And that has been driven to, by what's happened in, in, the, in the financial markets. Um, you know, their regulation is really important. Um, and there are ways in which you can incentivize and block um, you know, the way in which investment and financial markets so often um, focus on unproductive wealth um, and, and assets that don't um, create jobs, you know, the kind of uh, rent-seeking rent behavior that is, is very dominant. Um, 
And so, you know, it's, it's not enough. There's not enough time here to talk about to talk about that. But I, oh, I agree, it's fundamental. Hello. Sorry, Minister Kaikai, you're still on. Do you want to mute? No, thanks. Um, Yes. Yeah, so, and, and just as a final word, uh, and, you know, there's so much to sum up. And again, please do look at the report and some of the findings there. We talk a little bit about financialization, but you know that requires a whole other report, certainly. Um, I just want to go back to something that's really important in all of this. We've spoken about people power. We've spoken about policy. The really big part of this as well is the nar is the narrative, the story that we tell, the story that our leaders have about our interconnectedness, about how most of us want the best for each other and our children uh, and want to protect us uh, ourselves uh, and future generations. Um, and there's a few people, it really is a few people that are often blocking that change, but it's it really will take um, us coming together in, in whatever movements um, and, and really combining our efforts at this time to make sure that we don't look back on this moment, because I often feel this about the financial crisis and think, well, we didn't see the change that we, sh we should have seen. Thank you. And thank you to all of the speakers. Thank you, Pfizer. I'm for debt forgiveness, but not for time forgiveness. Budget constraint is hard. So Walid and Hajun, 30 seconds each, please. Um, yes, the financialization of the United States economy is one of the major drivers of inequality in the United States and around the world. Um, President Biden has not actually uh, done very much to describe his plans to take on Wall Street. Um, that was a big initiative of, for Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Um, yeah, we will we'll see what happens around financialization. But um, yeah, it's not it's not part of the Build Back Better agenda right now. Thank you, Wally. Thanks. Hajun, please. Yes. Uh, well, I'll uh, just uh, put it uh, bluntly. I mean, we need to uh, the regulate the finance uh, the very strongly. And uh, it is not because I uh, think it's unimportant, but because it's uh, so important. You know, which country had the traffic lights, you know, the traffic rules, uh, the seat, mandatory seat belts, and so on, when the people are the, the walking and driving on the, the, the carriages, horse carriages. You know? I mean, we have uh, introduced those things only after we invented powerful cars. You know? So now we have uh, traffic light, we have traffic rules, we have uh, the ABS brakes, uh, we have uh, airbags. We can drive at high speed only because that, that, that we have all those rules. Finance is like that. You know? We have to control it because it's so powerful. It's uh, the, something that, that, that can do a lot of good if we use it well, but if it's unregulated, it will uh, lead to disasters as it has been. Thank you. Thank you, Hajun. A very nice analogy there with regulation of traffic, which I, I agree very much in the case of finance we need. So um, we're just slightly over time, but it's really been worth it. It's been a fabulous event. Um, I'm very grateful to our speakers, to uh, Minister Francis Kai Kai, to Professor Ha Jung Chang, to uh, Walid Shahid, and a special thanks to Pfizer Shaheen, who not only spoke eloquently today, but actually had the idea to bring this event together. And so we're very grateful to her for that. And uh, thank you also to all, all the people in the audience who joined us and, and asked some great questions. So thanks to all and uh, till we meet again, virtually or otherwise, thanks very much and uh, goodbye.